Hi, everyone. This is Dan Sawyer. We'll give everyone just a few more minutes to get some more attendees joining our webinar here, and then I'll begin. All right, again, this is Dan Sawyer, and you've hit the right place. If you were looking for printing consciously, considering sustainability and 3D printing, a webinar brought to you by NatureWorks. My name is Dan Sawyer, and I've been with NatureWorks now just over 25 years. I, you probably can pick up some gray hairs in, in uh, my picture online and maybe even in the webinar. Uh, variety of technical first and then commercial roles more recently with the company and 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 most recently focused really on helping develop the 3d market uh, but again been exposed to kind of all aspects of of sustainability and and working in the bioplastics industry over those 25 years and i guess i'll kick it over to deepak to introduce himself and we'll get started with the webinar great thank you dan and i just want to say a quick welcome to all the attendees um, Deepak Venkatraman here. I also work with Dan Sawyer and uh, my, my role is kind of his uh, counterpart on the technical side with 3D printing and I also spend time uh, with technical support for our films business unit at NatureWorks. All right. Thanks, Deepak. Again, we're talking about printing consciously and thinking about sustainability aspects in 3D printing. So with that, I'll get started and, and then hand it over to Deepak partway through as we go. There we are. All right. So when people think about sustainability and, and the plastics world, they really envision things like uh, ocean pollution. And we all see pictures of, of fish or turtles being impacted by the plastics in the ocean. And we've found some information that's pretty interesting from the Pew Charitable Trust and Systems IQ where they've done research. And if you kind of look at these pictures down the left-hand column, uh, there's some pretty interesting statistics that they've developed. And, and they pointed out that without inter intervention or action, the flow of plastics into the ocean could triple by as soon as 2040. Uh, and of course, we as, as countries and as uh, individual corporations and businesses are starting to do some things to uh, reduce the flow of those plastics into the environment. But those efforts are expected to only impact that flow by about 7%. Now, plastics are an important part of our everyday life. They help us protect our food and beverages that we consume. They, they provide all kinds of good uses in durable applications from electronics to automotive applications. Um, and it oftentimes are the best material to use for certain applications. And because of that, we've seen as you go down the right side, that global plastic production has increased uh, about four times over the last 40 years. And so the rates of plastics use are continuing to grow. And if you look at that, what some people miss when they think about sustainability and really focus on that, that littering or ocean marine debris issue that we see in the pictures on the right, they miss that uh, those plastics that are produced and used really have a pretty big impact on greenhouse gas emissions in the environment. So there's more, uh, more sustainability aspect to it than just uh, the impact of litter on the environment, but a green, greenhouse gas impact. Um, it, with some of the research, uh, it's expected that the greenhouse gas emissions could reach 15% of the global carbon budget overall by 2050. And so when you think about it a little more holistically, uh, not just focused on uh, recycling or litter, uh, it's clear there's not just one single solution. And this really comes from breaking the plastic wave, uh, the, the research put together by the Pew Charitable Trust. 
So we'll dive in and start to talk about how we look at it at NatureWorks in a little bit more detail. Um, we like to align with a, a non-governmental organization called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and look at things in a way that's very similar to what they do. And what they've pointed out in some of their, their work is that when you look at the infrastructure, it really isn't there to fully take care of uh, the plastics in the environment. Um, and we're seeing continued leakage of, of plastic waste into uh, waterways and into the ocean. And it's really, it's an expensive problem to try to solve uh, and governments trying to take that on. It's a, it's a big undertaking. Um, and with, with the growth in plastics, we're seeing higher and higher greenhouse gas emissions. And so what they pointed out, and, and we believe it, is that we really won't ultimately recycle or dispose our way out of the plastic pollution in the environment. We need to do something more. And so what, what, the, how they've looked at plastics in, uh, in the environment and, and the impact and sustainability is that uh, traditionally we've looked at things in very much a, a linear model where we're taking finite, oftentimes petrochemical resources uh, out, of, out of the ground and, and producing the useful things that we need for our life every day. And when those things are used, uh, we're, we're making, it, making them and then wasting them, uh, wasting those resources by putting those products into landfill or incinerating them, or worse yet, uh, having them leak out as, as pollution in the environment. So what, what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation really uh, encourages us to do is to take a more circular look at this and try to make sure that the materials that we put into use stay in use. And so we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit deeper and talk about how uh, 3D printing can really fit into that. So when we look at this circular economy approach to things, um, you know, we think about how, how can 3D printing fit in? And one of the first principles we want to take a look at is uh, rather than using finite petrochemical resources, how can we decouple this process? We're ultimately going to need resources to produce the things we need. Um, but how do we decouple that from those petrochemical feedstocks? That's an important part. Um, it, the second aspect that really fits with additive manufacturing is designing and producing for reuse and then with uh, minimal material impact, so minimizing how much material is used. And then taking it forward, the area that I think a lot of people focus on is uh, what do we do with it after its use? And, and so we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper and talk about what we can do to contribute and help create an effective after-use uh, economy for those materials to ensure that they hopefully stay within that cycle. So going forward, as we talk about uh, renewably sourced materials, uh, producing plastics, if, if you get in it, into it and dive into the chemistry of plastics, they're oftentimes, uh, almost exclusively, a long carbon chain that makes the plastic. Uh, and I certainly won't dive into the chemistry too deeply here. It's been many years since I, since I was in school. Uh, but the way that we look at it differently when we use a renewable raw material is ultimately the source for those carbons. And for us, uh, producing a bio-based plastic, those are greenhouse gases that uh, start out as being plentiful and abundant in the atmosphere. Some of the same things that we're concerned about their effect on climate change ultimately can become the feedstock. And, and we take advantage of what nature does. Uh, really for us in our process, it's about having a plant sugar uh, that we can use for a fermentation process to produce lactic acid uh, that's used to polymerize the polymer. And you'll see here on the right, NGO is our just our trade name for PLA or polylactide, polylactic acid as it's, as it's known in the industry. And so next I'll share a little bit of a graphic uh, that, that goes through how we manufacture the polymer uh, using greenhouse gases ultimately.
Back in 1989, we had a big, crazy idea. What if we could turn greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide into products? Nature does it all the time, turning carbon dioxide into plants, entire forests, and huge structures like coral reefs. So we got to work, looking to plants for inspiration. Plants capture and sequester carbon dioxide, transforming it into long-chain sugar molecules. We ferment those sugars to make lactic acid, the building block of a whole range of advanced materials we call INGEO. It took a lot of hard work and some real innovation to bring these new materials to market. But today, INGEO is made into products like coffee capsules, diapers, cups, yogurt packaging, and electronics. And we're still innovating. Right now, we're working with bacteria to see if they can transform methane or carbon dioxide into INGEO. Because we believe at the intersection of science, technology, and sustainability, we can change the world without changing it at all. INGEO, naturally advanced. All right. I wish I had the animation skills that uh, went into producing a video like that. I'll be flipping forward here. There we go. And so when we look at renewable-based feedstocks, uh, part of the, the description that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation puts out there is that those feedstocks, if they're based on agricultural processes, really need to be sustainable in and of themselves. That you, can't, you can't just choose a bio-based resource and ignore how it's manufactured in and of itself as a feedstock. So we look at uh, the United Nations actually has some pretty good criteria aligned with some of the fundamental principles of sustainability that focus not only on the environmental aspects, but also on social and economic aspects of sustainability. So the Food and Agriculture Organization of, uh, of the UN actually has some pretty good uh, guidelines around that. And so what we do is we've actually gone out and contracted that our feedstock be certified by a third party and, and certainly encourage you to dig in further and look at uh, what ISCC plus certification involves. But that's what we've done with, with all of our feedstock. And the important takeaway is really that they take a more holistic approach rather than just looking at the type of feedstock or the type of crop and, and maybe the variety of crop that's grown. They look at how do we protect biodiversity the agricultural practices and how do they impact land use. Um, of course, environmental protection more holistically. Um, and then, of course, uh, the impact on greenhouse gases. But they also look at social aspects that include uh, the agricultural labor practices and how the farmers are going about growing the crop. And so it's not just enough to uh, decide which crop you think is best, but you need to look at things in the agriculture process more holistically. And uh, that's where we've gone out and had third party certification that, uh, that we're kind of taking a comprehensive approach to sustainability with our feedstock sourcing. And so again, that ISCC certification is over on the right side of the screen, but there are some other third party certifications that we, we utilize. And the reason that we do this, and I keep bringing up third party certification is, you know, you, any company can go ahead and make claims, but uh, based on, as you saw in the video, a lot of science, we, we want those to be based on good sound scientific information. And so, before we're gonna go out and make a claim. And, and, and in fact, the Federal Trade Commission governs this and, and has green guidelines that, that they encourage good sound data and testing behind any kind of marketing claims that you'll make. Um, Bio-based carbon certification is one that we do, very similar to uh, radiocarbon dating, where we can take a polymer or, uh, or an article and have it tested and they can tell if the carbon is new. So we'll go out and get that certified, uh, tested first, then certified either here in the US through the US Department of Agriculture with their bio-based content certification labeling scheme or Teyuve in, 
Europe that uh, that does a very similar certification. Um, when you look at the feedstock that we produce, uh, one of the questions that comes up is whether uh, there's genetic material in the in the polymer. Uh, we get we get some questions along those lines, and we're able to test and really show that no, through the process of manufacturing the polymer, uh, you lose any of that genetic material. So we do testing that verifies that again through a third party. Um, even with the feedstock, we do have a program as well where uh, if customers are concerned about uh, the sourcing of the feedstock that they can actually uh, pay a, a certain amount to ensure that uh, there's a mass balance amount of feedstock that's sourced from a non-genetically modified crop. And so that's kind of an add-on for customers who want to really influence the agricultural practices also operated through a third party through ISCC. And so by now you might be asking yourself, uh, why do we care if it's bio-based as a feedstock or not? Um, we've been making things from petrochemicals for quite a while now, and uh, why should we care? Well, when you look at it, the fact that you're using a renewable feedstock means you're, again, taking some of those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere when you start the manufacturing process. And so if you've heard of life cycle analysis as a tool, uh, what they do is really account for all the inputs and effluents in manufacturing a product all the way from, as they describe it, cradle uh, to, to grave. Well, when, when we look at that whole process, really a, a big share of the impact is on manufacturing a polymer uh, in that life cycle. And so we do what's called an eco profile as you produce the polymer when it leaves the factory and we'll benchmark against traditional polymers. And you can see by using a bio-based feedstock, we have a much lower impact than some of the traditional polymers. The example here that's highlighted is against ABS, uh, roughly 84% less greenhouse gas emissions because again, we're capturing greenhouse gases to start the whole process. Um, similarly, because the sun is doing some of the work for us uh, in photosynthesis and linking up those carbons and making the sugar, uh, we get we get similar credit for that. And the fact that uh, that we're doing that means a 60% reduction in non-renewable energy use. And these are just a couple of indicators that life cycle experts look at, but two of the more important ones that people look at with feedstock sustainability. Now, a lot of folks know our material. PLA is commonly used in desktop printing and most commonly used in desktop printing, probably as a material. But what they sometimes aren't aware is that the material is a really strong material and can be used in some industrial applications. And so we've started to see those evolved and the same great printability that people are used to with our material in desktop printing can be extended into large format printing like these examples here. Uh, the example on the left is Oak Ridge National Labs where they've printed a bio-based composite uh, in replacing carbon fiber ABS composite material uh, for precast concrete molds. And the benefit there is going to carbon fiber ABS to get printability is really kind of overkill. Uh, you can have a bio-based composite that really performs and, and it's all about in these large format prints, avoiding warping. Uh, the last thing you want to see is 24 or 48 hours into a, a large format print having a failure and having that come off the, the print bed uh, on the right. They're extending that even into large, uh, large scale composite manufacturing processes where the mold would be used as a, as a layup. In this case, it's a, a marine application. And so really taking the inherent performance in uh, lower warping of, of a bio-based material, but adding a bio-based additive to stiffen that up even further and ensure that it's not warping. All right, so we'll continue stepping through. We've talked about the source of the material. We'll step into uh, design and production and how w those aspects really fit in with additive manufacturing as a whole, uh, not so sp specific to our material, but just in the additive manufacturing process really lends itself to those aspects of the circular economy. 
just inherently and intrinsically um, added to manufacturing, we all know it's very customizable. You can make designs that are just right for the application and oftentimes more complex than you can through traditional manufacturing uh, methodologies. And uh, the, the process itself typically lends itself to uh, quicker production and development cycles and oftentimes can eliminate the need for external tooling that sometimes people overlook the impact of making the tools that we need to make the things we're making uh, in manufacturing. Um, it also allows for on-demand on production. We saw this with a lot of COVID response related articles that were printed. Um, and uh, in the end, it, oftentimes it all contributes to not only the environmental aspect, but cost saving uh, by optimizing the part design and reducing part waste uh, or printing waste, you can reduce the, the cost of manufacturing as well. So next, I'll jump into an example that really illustrates this very well. And uh, a lot of people have heard the, the sort of buzzword almost today, uh, design for additive manufacturing. And where we think that's a really good example is when you look at a part like the one on the left here, uh, probably designed by someone with uh, kind of a mechanical engineering or machining background, I'm guessing, where uh, they're used to more traditional subtractive manufacturing techniques. Uh, and, and really gearing the design to allow you to uh, machine out a part and have the resulting part have the strength that you need, but be something that you can really cut out of a bigger chunk. And so people will oftentimes start the additive, even the additive manufacturing with a, that kind of design in mind. But what they've done here is they've uh, applied uh, topology optimization and considered where the stresses and loads will be and uh, really allowed uh, that allowed them to design specifically a uh, design that still gives the strength required, but minimizes the material used and, and still results in the same strength that they need. And so you see not only less material use, but probably a faster print time by not having to print quite as much material with the, the optimized part on the right. And I think we have a more, uh, user-friendly example of that that I can pop in here. Uh, this is a very common social media person out there. Tom Sandlander is, is uh, active in the additive manufacturing space, and he applied some of those principles in designing this bracket. Uh, I'm not sure what he was going to do once he got up onto his workbench, but obviously it displays or demonstrates that uh, with a fairly minimal amount of material uh, in this one being produced from PLA, you can produce something that gives you the strength uh, to hold a human. So very strong. All right, so I, I think a lot of folks probably came into this thinking more about what we do next with the material after we produce it or, or uh, print with it. And so we'll jump into some of those topics next because uh, if we're going to get all the way around the loop, we'll want to we'll want to continue on. Um, so when we look at it, we'll first contemplate reuse. Uh, whenever you can reuse the material, you're going to have the, the least impact. And then we'll jump into what we call organics recycling and talk about maybe where that fits and where it doesn't fit. Um, in brackets, you'll see compostability. That's what we tend to describe it as. And then uh, we'll end up the circle uh, turning back on recycling, both mechanical and chemical recycling next. All right. So I didn't find super great uh, uses of uh, or examples of reuse. I think they're still evolving and we certainly look for more. Uh, but just reusing the plastic wherever possible is going to be the, the most efficient and least impactful way we can uh, kind of influence the circular economy because uh, all the energy that went into making the plastic in the first place is conserved if we can reuse it as is rather than having to do a lot of reprocessing to get it into whatever we use it for next. So the example here, it kind of combines spools and some printed drawers for a storage unit. And then, uh, of course, with uh, 
not too far down the road, uh, the holidays coming up, you can always use reuse your spools as is to wind up all kinds of things like uh, decorative lights here. Um, on the right, I, I share an example of uh, someone who really put a lot more thought into how to reuse, again, spools as an example, but um, how they, they design their spool for disassembly and reuse. And so really developed it uh, and put, like I said, a lot of design into that so that they can be reused for uh, hanging your clothes up after after use. So um, if anyone after this uh, presentation has examples, we certainly would look for uh, look for those and, and would like to see those and share them on social media. Again, uh, I'd like to pause real quickly. I think I overlooked mentioning if you do have questions, anything technical in nature, ask those uh, and then uh, we'll try to address those as we go along. Um, anything with the webinar or sound or anything like that, we'll try to address as we go along. When we get deeper into it, we'll save any of the content related questions and try to answer those as best we can given the time at the end. So again, keep those questions coming in the chat area. So a question we get asked a lot, and I, I, I oftentimes will sort of play devil's advocate and describe that what when I'm asked what I do for a living, we talk about producing a, a polymer from greenhouse gases or producing a plant-based polymer, and people will instantly jump and say, so it's biodegradable. And playing devil's advocate, I'll, I'll ask, well, what do you mean by that? And sometimes they'll, they'll pretty much get stumped right there. Um, and, and we get asked uh, in 3D printing as well, why, why can't we just compost our 3D prints? And so we really have dug into this and, and certainly experienced it in a number of our other markets. We do a lot in, in um, food service wear and, and you see some flexible bags here that we can be a component in. Um, and the value that we found in some of those markets really is making it possible to divert that food waste, get it away from a landfill or uh, an incinerator where it can have negative consequences on those waste streams and instead save the value that's in that carbon and reutilize it in producing good compost. And so composters are really looking for a good, clean feedstock. Um, they'll take certified compostable serviceware, but only where it brings them that valuable uh, either food waste or on the right, these are NGO coffee capsules uh, carrying the coffee grounds. So um, they're not really looking for plastics. They'll take them if it's really easy to identify and it brings them that valuable feedstock. Next, it's important to understand that biodegradable and compostable aren't necessarily exactly the same thing. Biodegradable is kind of a higher level term that just says something will biodegrade over kind of an undefined period of time and eventually go away. And while that's interesting, uh, the value is somewhat limited uh, at the rates we're using plastics that really doesn't provide us a good solution to use and then get rid of and ultimately recapture the carbon and reuse it uh, in a reasonable period of time. So there really is no certification test for biodegradability on its own. The process for breaking PLA down is, is really a three-step process where first the polymer gets broken down by heat and moisture uh, to smaller and smaller units that become more like the lactic acid we start with. And once it, once it gets down to small lactic acid units, then microbes in the compost can consume those and produce CO2. And, and ultimately the result is that you break down to you know, water, CO2, and usable compost when you couple that with organic material. And so, you know, when we get asked about compostability, and I, I know the Biodegradable Products Institute that is the certification body here in the, the U.S. for composting has a decision tree that they developed. We keep it even more simple and sometimes ask the first question, uh, does this article really enable organics recycling? And so when you, when you ask that question, if the answer is no, we really feel like pursuing recycling options are probably a better answer than trying to pursue composting. When you look at, uh, you know, if the article is something that would bring 
valuable organic material to uh, the composters, then you got to go through and do the the testing, which includes four different tests there. You can see disintegration testing, you analyze the heavy metal content of the of the polymer, and then do uh, uh, biodegra biodegradation testing that looks for full conversion to CO2, and then ultimately look at how does that compost affect uh, growing organisms, so ecotoxicity. And when you go through that process, um, you, you get all those test results and then submit those to a third party that would do the certification. And so when you look at that, having all the testing work done um, and then being a member of the organization or paying an uh, organization fee, you're, you're looking at something like ten to $15,000. And that makes sense if you're producing huge numbers of the same type of part and you can use that certification but it isn't really aligned with uh, with additive manufacturing where the beauty of our industry is that we can produce one-off, uh, unique, customized, and limited production parts. So um, it, really important that we think through this, this flow chart and process and ask ourselves, is this really the best end of or after use for the carbon in the polymer? Yeah, just some examples here uh, on the left, a gimbal that was produced with with uh, one of our grades, 3D870, a very complex part. And on the right, a very large part um, that uh, was produced by Spectra 3D using stacker printers, uh, some of our friends here in Minnesota. But you can tell these are very large parts that really won't fit with the, the scale and size and, and clearly won't bring the organic material that composters are looking for. So next, uh, I'm going to take a pause here and throw things over to Deepak, and he's going to dive into the after use that starts to talk about recycling, both mechanical and chemical. So Deepak, if you're ready, I'll kick it over to you. I'm ready. Thanks, Dan. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, remind the audience yeah, to keep uh, you know adding questions to the sidebars there. We see some Great conversations going on on the side there, which is all good, uh, but please go ahead and add your questions too. Um, so Dan's already kind of uh, touched on a couple of components of this uh, circular economy diagram, and I'm gonna be talking about the uh, mechanical recycling portion of it. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, so when you think about mechanical recycling, uh, the sources of where the, these materials come from can typically be divided into two buckets, your post-industrial waste stream or your post-consumer waste stream. And by looking at the uh, photos on here, it's pretty clear what the big differences are between the two. Uh, post-industrial, think of material, waste material that's generated on the, uh, on the shop floor in a factory, for example. So your transition filaments, your uh, off-spec filaments that kind of end up on the floor. Um, in this case, it's a picture of some film on rolls even though it's waste material, it, you can tell it's kept uh, pretty secluded, kept clean. So the, it's the uh, possibility of polymer cross-contamination is low and um, it can be very easily brought back into the, uh, into the main process and uh, combined with virgin material. Post-consumer streams, on the other hand, you can see from that picture, you can expect to get um, a variety of plastics because of the way it's collected. So the best way to think of th think of this is the stuff that you put into your uh, recycling bins. For example, it's a it's a mix of plastics. You can have food waste in it, non plastic contamination. So it's a little bit of a a, a collection nightmare and a sorting nightmare for uh, people involved in this. So needless to say, the end product that you get, your recycled material that you get out of this. Uh, is heavily dependent on how, how much effort you spend on the reprocessing side. And this can, of course, the more you put into the reprocessing, the more expensive it can become. Um, and depending on how much contamination is in the stream, the final performance of your part that you fabricate out of this recycled stream um, could be variable. But within the uh, circular economy model, both of these are uh, equally important streams to consider and to try and keep in that loop that uh, we've been showing this time. Next slide, Dan. There we go. So 
if, if we focus on mechanical recycling under the lens of 3D printing, so the, uh, some of the benefits are pretty obvious. Uh, you keep material in that loop, you can bring it back, uh, use it with virgin material with uh, lower energy input. And uh, these recycling processes are, you know, technically they've been proven out, they're very feasible for typical materials used in 3D printing, like the PLAs, your PET Gs and ABSs. Um, these can also be extended to say, uh, some plastic powders that are used in part of that fusion type printer platforms. Uh, they can very easily get recycled as long as they're handled correctly between use and when they're brought back in. Um, it, it can also extend the manufacturing process that they can be used in. So for example, the filaments that you make for it, um, that might be off spec or wide spec, they can always be chopped down, converted into pellets again, and used in injection molding, for example, or vice versa. You can have thermoforming applications where once the uh, part is thermoformed, people can take the edge trim, flake it, grind it, repelletize it, and make 3D filament out of it, for example. So those are the benefits. Um, these obviously come with challenges, as I'm sure a lot of the, a lot of the people in this audience are aware. Um, you know, the, the quality of the material that you get is, is very dependent, like I mentioned earlier, on how well it's collected and how well it's reprocessed. So it's basically, you know, your, your output is as good as your input. Um, and the other challenge that we face is the current infrastructure isn't really set up to accept uh, 3D printed parts or additive manufactured parts. What they typically, what the recyclers typically want is uh, your HTPE milk jugs, or your PET bottles, your clear bottles, think of uh, your water bottles or your Coke bottles that, that go through the recycling process. Um, and just by virtue of additive manufacturing being relatively uh, new industry, the volumes that uh, we generate are typically enough to justify economies of scale, um, while that will come as additive is adopted wider. Um, Today, it's not as big as some of the other forms of manufacturing. But regardless, that's not to say that there aren't uh, avenues where you can get clean, uh, you know, source separated materials uh, that are recycled and uh, that you can use back in the loop. Um, and we're highlighting some of these here. So closed loop venues are one where you basically have control of what material comes into your uh, venue and what leaves. So you can have a very pure stream, very clean stream of uh, plastic waste coming coming out of that venue. Um, post industrial scrap, like we've already talked about, is is a very common way or a very common source to obtain clean uh, a clean material stream. And then uh, print service bureaus would be another option um, where it could essentially be acting like a, a, a centralized collection agency because of uh, all the filament and the parts that they make um, and all the uh, raw materials that go and basically have one site where all of this can be collected and you could potentially get materials from, from these service bureaus and reprocess them. Next slide there. Um, so this one is just a, a, a demonstration of uh, one of our customers, Flo, who typically thermoforms uh, coffee coffee capsules and coffee pods, like you can see in the center of that, of that screen there. And uh, they thermoform it um, out of um, extruded sheet, like the ones on the, on the left there. And once you pop those pods out, you're left with a lot of material, what they call trim scrap, which is still um, you know, high quality material and still has good properties. And for all intents can be valued close to uh, virgin material. In this case, what Flow did is partner with uh, Caracol to take all of that scrap um, and reprocess it. So reprocess that NGO-based trim scrap, convert it to pellets, and then actually upcycle it to print um, uh, uh, large format furniture that's used in uh, trade show uh, furnitures. So this is an actual picture of the booth. Um, you can kind of see the stools and the high tops and actually the bar that they show below the uh, flow banner. They've all been printed 
using um, trim scrap and, and uh, post-industrial waste. And the additional uh, benefit of doing this is they were able to print it on a direct resin uh, platform, which you can imagine takes out a lot of the uh, um, supply chain in terms of uh, the energy that goes into making a filament and moving that out. And so it's another way that um, 3D printing, especially direct to print um, uh, printer platforms can help with the circular economy principles. Yeah, Deepak, it's really hard to capture how you know, how good the design is on these parts uh, that were produced in Italy until you see them close up. It, uh, there's even a texture that's printed into these. So when you see them close up, it's, uh, it's quite a bit better than the typical trade show furniture that you get when you rent it from the venue, for sure. For sure. And, and we actually did have one of these in our boots, uh, just to add to Dan's point. We did sit on those tools for hours and, you know, it uh, makes a big difference. They are actually pretty comfortable and designed well to, you know, uh, have functional use. All right. So like I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, filament converters today already using post-industrial uh, scrap material in their, in their products. So up here in this slider, a few examples. Um, of, of people today taking their either transition spools or you know off spec material grinding it up and converting into a filament like 3d fuel with their refuel pla filament uh, protopasta with their recycled pet g and mcpb again with their um, industrially uh, post-industrial uh, waste recovered recycled pla filament so this this kind of concept is is already being embraced um, definitely being embraced by the uh, ad additive market today. Uh, this is an, another example of a, of a case study where we um, partner with uh, a few of our downstream customers and really wanted to demonstrate how in a closed loop venue materials, plastic materials can be uh, reused and uh, really create an after use scenario with with the in this case the cups that were used at the uh, lowlands festival so the concept here was especially when there isn't an outlet for organics uh, collection or, or composting collections we can still take these ngo cups uh, recycle them um, reprocess them and convert them into uh, you know upcycled um, articles like an injection molded uh, headphone that Technaro did and uh, 3D filament as well. And what we were also able to show was um, how you can really create, um, you know, a, a viable uh, after use scenario in the context of a closed loop venue. Again, this is kind of a busy slide, but um, real quick, given uh, what we just talked about on uh, regarding collecting cups from a closed loop venue, uh, for us to better understand the concept, NatureWorks had an internal R&D project where we wanted to kind of go through and really understand what it would take to go from collecting cups to uh, reprocessing it to a point where we have a product that could be reused um, in this case as uh, feedstock for 3D printing. So I won't go through every step, but you can kind of see when you follow the flowchart there from starting with the, uh, the collection showing the bale material, where it's being ground into flakes. It's very similar to uh, a real life recycling process. So even though we started with a closed loop uh, collection of plastics um, in geocups, in this case, we still had to clean it up enough and uh, filter it so we can get a product at the end of the day that has a purity content of greater than 99.5% uh, PLA and has the mechanical properties that, in this case, would be adequate enough and good enough uh, quality to make filament out of and then print with that filament or use it in, again, a direct resin to uh, print platform. So 
once we got the material cleaned up and um, collected from this process, what we did on the next slide, Dan, is combine that with uh, some post-industrial uh, NGO waste and made a compound that was 100% recycled product. So it had 10% of post-consumer content from the uh, cups crap that we collected and 90% of uh, post-industrial um, PLA material. And we partnered with uh, Titan Robotics who um, had um, this printer at an AMUG a few years ago and uh, were printing on their hybrid printer which was able to print with uh, filament as well as pellet uh, resin, uh, resin to print capability. And the application we targeted was uh, investment casting. And you can see from the picture on the left, um, the final part that, that was actually cast from an NGO mold is, is that kind of dark gray piece. Uh, in the middle there is uh, just Dan next to the printer, just to show you the scale and the size of that printer and kind of um, um, how it's printing the finished part that is then shown on the uh, uh, picture on the right. So the blue um, portions of that printed part is the, uh, the recycled PLA compound. And the kind of off-white part on the bottom uh, is the NGO 3D450 support material that was uh, printed using a, a filament-fed uh, extruder head. So that, so that was uh, talking about uh, mechanical recycling and switching gears to chemical recycling. This has uh, of late become a very interesting kind of a hot space for having another alternative to uh, mechanically recycled uh, plastic streams. Um, so there, there's been a lot of work done on trying to figure out processes that will basically take your polymer um, do some chemistry on it, and depending on the starting material and uh, how that polymer was made, you can go through different steps of, uh, of say, reformation, and that'll take it, that'll take the polymer chains back to their starting uh, monomers or at least uh, substituents. So this this plot here or this uh, this graphic here just kind of shows some of the uh, methods that could be used. Uh, depending on the on the plastics that you want to chemically recycle. So, for example, if you were looking at NGO PLA, hydrolysis for us is a very effective and very easy process to break down the PLA back to its its monomer, which is basically its its starting product. If you wanted to work with uh, PET, there are numerous options there. You can go through gly glycolysis, for example, to get back the uh, the monomers. Um, and then similarly with uh, nylon as well. The, yeah. There we go. So this this little uh, diagram here just highlights um, how simple it is to really chemically recycle uh, PLA back to its starting material. So on the left, we're starting with a long polymer chain, which is the uh, NGO PLA that everybody here is familiar with. And if you follow the blue hydrolysis line that goes to lactic acid, that's essentially what, uh, that's essentially the product of subjecting the NGO polymer to um, moisture or water and uh, slightly elevated temperatures. It can easily break down the chain and go back to lactic acid, which can then be repolymerized to make NGO um, lact uh, polylactic acid again. And in theory, this would kind of be an infinite loop of, uh, you know, depolymerization and polymerization, and you can kind of keep going um, with this process because it is such a simple and easy step for uh, for NGO. Again, Deepak, we've used that on very large scale it, with some of our post-industrial scrap in the past. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So again, um, just kind of outlining the typical process that you might go through if you were going through a chemical recycling step to um, clean up your, your uh, uh, post-industrial or post-consumer scrap material. If you kind of look through this flowchart, and I won't go through it again, uh, it's very similar to 
a mechanical recycling on the front end where you kind of have to bring in your material, clean it up a little bit. In the case of PLA, um, we can use hydrolysis, like I mentioned, to really break down the components um, to its, its, uh, its starting point. You can purify that. And if you continue the purification process, you can take it all the way back to lactic acid, which like I mentioned, can be used as a starting material for polymerizing PLA, or you can uh, functionalize it to use in um, higher value applications such as making ethyl lactate solvents that you know get used a lot in the uh, electronics industry. The other thing you could do if you stop at the purification step, um, you can make lactide, which is the actually chemical intermediate between lactic acid and uh, the polymer PLA. And you can functionalize that as well, as is the case um, with Isan's uh, e resin, which is a, it, the lactide becomes a component of that photocurable system. Okay. Next slide, then. Should be there. Yep. Thanks. Okay. And uh, you know this just to show how easy the hydrolysis process is and how you can chemically. Uh, easily recycled back uh, PLA. This is a, a picture of the uh, ESUN plant where they today uh, commercial, on a commercial scale recycle PLA back to um, its uh, various uh, products and they can basically do the same thing that we had outlined uh, in the chemical recycling step, take it back to its uh, Sm smaller uh, chain lengths and react it and make uh, ethyl lactate solvents out of it. Yeah, they're really useful in uh, electronics cleaning applications. It's a big use for ethyl lactate as a solvent. So kind yeah, of green, gr greener solvents for manufacturing. Yeah, so the big win here is taking a, a, a waste stream and um, you know reprocessing it to make higher value products out of it. So this is kind of our, our closing slide. And, um, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, uh, Dan and I have talked about, you know, what can, the, what can the consumer, what can we do as a group? Um, you know, hopefully he's conveyed the message that it's not just the after use that matters. It is a, a bigger picture where we should really consider where the material is sourced from, how it's designed and how it's used, and then also how it's either brought back into the, the system or how it's managed after its uh, use. So uh, the, the whole picture, according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and Circular Economy, is important. Um, the other thing that we can really do as, a, as an industry is really you know, put some effort around engaging and developing markets around recycled uh, products. And I think that will really help get some momentum and, and kind of get us moving in the right direction. And when we do do that, we just have to keep an eye on and really be vigilant about, you know, basically not greenwashing. All of our claims need to be uh, founded on facts and need to be able to be backed because there is chance for uh, a lot of greenwashing out there and that really doesn't help anybody in this industry or, or, or the plastics industry in, in general. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Deepak. And with that, uh, I know some questions have come in in the chat for sure. And I've tried to answer a couple when I was uh, off duty and, and just running the slides for Deepak. But uh, one that I saw that was a good question is uh, around uh, compostability and biodegradability. Again, uh, we don't see that as a great fit in additive. But uh, the question was around uh, uh, around how additives can impact that, and it's certainly something that needs to be considered. So um, another challenge, maybe if you were trying to do uh, 3D printed parts, is the fact that people are putting different additives in, whether they be colorants or other materials, all those have to be considered. So it has to be the final part and the final formulation that is evaluated when you go through the testing and certification process. So it's it's certainly another thing that can influence. Uh, frankly, additives can influence and are a big factor in the recycling. When you look at the cleanup processes that Deepak 
described, uh, they, they have an impact there as well. So um, keeping a, a stream as clean as possible uh, and then uh, making sure that it's adequately cleaned up as it's being recycled is definitely the challenge that leads to the need for those high value outlets that uh, I think there were some good discussions on, you know, where people were at in the chat, uh, depending on their location locally and what they're able to do. Some had some outlets that were kind of more along the lines of reuse, I, I think in South America where uh, some of the scrap materials were being donated for producing art and, and uh, I, I, we'd like to look at it. And we've seen some pretty cool art it produced via additive um, and, and mimicking nature wherever possible. That's that's a pretty cool application for it. Uh, we oftentimes forget the the STEM science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, oftentimes needs to include the A, the art form, and and uh, you know, like I said, wherever we can, nature inspired on the art form. Again, um, just technically speaking, we are recording the webinar, and we'll make that and the slides available after after the webinar. Uh, we apologize to anyone that uh, we didn't use great examples of. Uh, certainly, only a limited amount of time, and we've done a lot of great work with a lot of great. Uh, converters that are making filament and making formulations out of our material out there. Um, I, I would say uh, really just encourage everyone to continue the collaboration. We saw that begin here on the webinar with people chatting back and forth, um, wherever, wherever possible, encourage that, share uh, good uses, good recycling case studies uh, that help us keep those materials in use aligned with the circular economy. Um, I, I think we've answered a lot of the important questions out there. And so with that, I think we'll, we'll uh, call this a day and appreciate everyone joining us on the webinar. And uh, again, uh, engage with us via social media, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, even Facebook, we're, we're out there um, and, and be engaged with each other and with us. And We'll look forward to collaborating with you all on uh, uh, keeping materials more circular. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks for joining. And I was just gonna add, uh, feel free to reach out to us if you had any questions that we you know, maybe didn't get to address here or if you had any uh, questions or comments regarding anything we presented too. So always, always uh, good to kind of connect and uh, meet with the uh, users and uh, people in the market. All right. Bye, all. Thanks again for joining us today. Yeah.